next Thursday. Before we can put Vietnam behind us, we have to face it, experience the powerful season premiere of Tour of Duty. And TV Guy calls it a standout, absorbing, satisfying. Ken Wall's undercover to blow the lid off organized crime in the season premiere of Wise Guy. Good evening from CBS News. This is Newsbreak. Secretary of State Schultz and Soviet Foreign Minister Shevardnadze have concluded talks in Washington. They met with President Reagan this afternoon. Tomorrow, the two sides are expected to announce the framework of a treaty banning medium-range nuclear missiles. A Lebanese man accused of hijacking a Jordanian airliner has been brought to the United States. FBI agents picked up Fawaz Yunus on a small boat in the Mediterranean. Senator Joseph Biden today admitted plagiarizing in law school, but called charges of plagiarism in his speeches much ado about nothing. Now this. Becoming an American Express card member is now as simple as picking up one of these. Because now you can apply for membership over the phone. Membership has its privileges. To apply, call 1-800-THE-CARD. Americans celebrated the 200th birthday of the Constitution today. President Reagan joined the party in Philadelphia. I'm Charlie Rose, CBS News, Washington. More news later on this CBS station. This is CBS. It's the Great Shape Clearance at your Lincoln Mercury dealer. Get great savings on Mercury Cougar when you buy a preferred equipment package along with 1.9 APR financing. Save on Mercury Sable with a preferred equipment package and 1.9% financing. The savings keep coming on Topaz, Lynx, and Tracer 2 with 1.9% financing. See your Lincoln Mercury dealer now. The shape you wanna... Bringing in a third century of freedom at 11. We the People 200, the Constitutional Gala, is sponsored by Extra Strength Excedrin, the headache medicine. When you have a big headache, you want big relief. Extra Strength Excedrin, from Bristol Myers. Our gathering tonight does not stand alone as a single event. It comes as the culmination of the national observance of the Constitution's bicentennial. 200 years ago, when our young nation celebrated its new constitution, the biggest bash of all was thrown in Philadelphia. In 1876, when the country celebrated its 100th birthday, people from every corner of the nation came to the great centennial exposition in Philadelphia. And in 1987, once again, although they've traveled in ways the founding fathers never dreamed of, whether they've come from Boston, Atlanta, Toronto, Miami, or Kansas City, millions of visitors have found that all roads lead to Philadelphia. Philadelphia Tower, this is Eastern 200 on approach. Dr. Franklin. Well, thank you. It's always nice to come home. I'm looking forward to an exciting time. Can you sign here? Uh. Enjoy your stay. Indeed, I shall. And exciting it was. It all started on May 25th when Vice President Bush and many of the governors of the original 13 states gathered in Philadelphia to commemorate the start of the Constitutional Convention 200 years ago to the very day. There was a festival recreating life in Philadelphia as it was in my day. I can tell you, in 1787, there was no such frivolity as there was this past summer. Daily fife and drum promenades, concerts, Performances by bands and choirs from all 50 states, festivals, feasts, and fireworks. But there were serious events as well. On July 16th, to observe the anniversary of the Great Compromise, which created the Senate and House of Representatives, members of the U.S. Congress came to Philadelphia for a special commemorative session. 
huge jowl. In June, there was a symposium on political humor around the world. I was impressed by what's going on in the field today. Some of these fellows are quite sharp. There stretches across the Delaware River a magnificent structure known as the Benjamin Franklin Bridge. And as part of the celebration, that bridge was lighted for the first time by yours truly. But today was the big day. This morning, a magnificent parade was held. It passed right in front of Independence Hall. Part of it was a recreation of the Grand Federal Procession of July 4th, 1788. At noon, there was a ceremony marking the historic moment. And the speaker was, in keeping with the greatness of the occasion, the President of the United States. You could go from here to live in another country, France, but you wouldn't become a Frenchman. You could go to Japan and live there, but you wouldn't become a Japanese. But people from every corner of the world can come to this country and become an American. If you'd ask us in 1787 why we created the Constitution, you would have heard a lot of different answers, but they all come down to this. We did it for you, the people. And 200 years later, I, Benjamin Franklin, can say, people, you've done us proud. Great tour. Their computer expects us tomorrow. No room, no bath, no bed. Now what? Rent a towel and sleep on the beach? I've got a headache this big and it's screaming for Excedrin. Excedrin, the headache medicine. Regular strength pain relievers give you only this much medicine. But Excedrin gives you this much more. Nothing proven stronger without a prescription. I had a headache this big, but I took Excedrin and it's gone. Excedrin, from Bristol Myers. Excedrin, the headache medicine. The presentation soon will start, and your work plays a crucial part. Pressure's on, getting higher. Differences, you stay drier. Band Solid makes the difference, and the difference is fantastic. Difference is, Band's wide oval shape glides on super dry and keeps you drier than these leading solids. Pressure's on, getting higher. Difference is, you stay drier. Band Solid makes the difference, and the difference is fantastic. Introducing Quackers, little ducks with a lot of flavor. So now, all the cheddar cheese flavor of a cheddar cheese puff is in a little duck. And all the sour cream and onion flavor of a sour cream and onion. Ladies and gentlemen, Cicely Tyson. was embroiled in a world war, the outcome of which would determine whether we would continue to live as a free people in a free society. Patriotism was at an all-time high, and we cherished the simple values of our nation as never before. There was a short film made that starred Frank Sinatra, and it featured a song called The House I Live In. It extolled the common man and crystallized the common hope for peace and a return to normalcy. Tonight, though the circumstances have changed, the song still has significance to all people. We are extremely fortunate to have a remarkably gifted performer to reinterpret that message for us. And it's even more special to know but she is a hometown girl, born and raised right here in Philadelphia. Joined by Reverend Robert Taylor's Fellowship Tabernacle Church Choir, under the direction of Bud Ellison, is Miss Patty LaBelle.
What is America to me? A name, a man, the flag. A certain word, democracy. What is America to me? Walter Matthau. There are certain numbers that have significance beyond the obvious.
Seven is lucky. Thirteen is unlucky. One is the loneliest number. Ten is perfection. And so on. When we mention the number nine, one of two things comes immediately to mind. Either the number of players on a baseball team or the number of judges on the Supreme Court. Of course, there are other similarities. For example, the words Frankfurter and Berger. <laughs> they, of course, will always be a part of the both institutions. Naturally, this being a special day in the history of our country, we will discuss baseball. <laughs> now, baseball is a game where opposing sides face each other, and after battling back and forth, come to a binding conclusion. No, I'm sorry. I I'm sorry, I've got my thoughts mixed up. That's the definition of the Supreme Court. <laughs> See, the Supreme Court is the final arbiter of cases involving the Constitution. It is the domain of nine justices supremely respected for their devotion to the law of the land and for their wisdom in dealing with issues that affect the lives of all citizens. They sit together, deliberating, discussing, agonizing, and determining as best they can the meaning of those noble phrases in the Constitution and how those thoughts apply to the world in which we live today. Today. They have the power to reverse decisions of the lower courts. They have even been known to reverse their own decisions. In this respect, they're usually more flexible than Major League umpires. <laughs> In the annals of baseball, there are many Ironmen, stars who have been on top for many years, but they cannot compare to the exclusive club that comprises the Supreme Court. Over the past 200 years, only 16 people have served as Chief Justice and 91 as associate justices. From the stadiums of America came heroes, men like Ruth Gehrig, Roberto Clemente, Willie Mays, Hank Greenberg, and Jackie Robinson. And from the temple of jurisprudence, there arose giants, names like Marshall and Holmes, Black, Douglas, Warren, Brandeis, Cardozo, and of course, Frankfurter and Berger men who changed the course of history or kept it on a proper path. For a century, ballparks have been filled with loyal followers of the game, the fans. They were nameless and faceless, but a crucial part in the balance of the game. And in the judicial arena, there were many ordinary citizens who never dreamt of immortality, who became part of the legal history of our nation. Names like Marbury and Plessy and Rowe, Brown, Gideon, Miranda, and Dred Scott. They are woven inextricably into the fabric of 200 years of justice, testing the very foundation of the lofty premise that the Constitution shall endure as the law of the land. Just as baseball grew from the sandlots and the fields and farm country with flower sacks for bases, the Supreme Court also grew from its start in 1790 at the Rural Exchange Building in New York. Those first sessions under Chief Justice John Jay went relatively unnoticed. But the court finally hit its stride with a case that established once and for all its importance as an equal partner in the affairs of government. The case Marbury versus Madison. The issue, can a justice of the peace who was appointed by President Adams but never given his commission be kept from taking office by the next president, Thomas Jefferson? Of course he can't. 
A president can't take it upon himself to undo what another president has done. But why not? If he can fire an appointee, then surely he can prevent an appointment from being carried out. With all due respect, the issue is not the appointment of the justice of the peace. The real issue is whether the Supreme Court had the power to void legislation it deemed in disagreement with the Constitution. Are we splitting hairs already, Counselor? No, we're just getting down to the roots. I would like to quote uh, Chief Justice Marshall, if I may. And if I may, I'd like to stop you. Well, shall I quote you the First Amendment on free speech? We already know that. Let's hear what Justice Marshall had to say. He said, the Constitution is either a superior, paramount law, unchangeable by ordinary means, or it is on a level with ordinary legislative acts, and like other acts, is alterable when the legislature shall please to alter it. In other words, even though the court tried to give the Congress a power that it wasn't granted under the Constitution, the court turned right around and said to the Congress, don't tell us what the law is, we will tell you. And they made it stick. We are grateful for your clarification of the obfuscation inherent in this precedent-setting determination. What? In other words, thank you. My pleasure. The court has taken strong positions on a multiplicity of issues and not always to the delight of those who raised the issues in the first place. You are referring, I assume, to the Dred Scott case of 1857. A good case in point. By a vote of seven to two, the Supreme Court denied that a Negro was a citizen of the United States, even though he had once lived in a so-called free state. But the nation redeemed itself with the passage of the 14th Amendment, which was adopted in 1868. That, as you all know, gave equality of treatment to both blacks and to whites. Tell that to a man named Plessy. Do you wish to be heard, sir? for centuries. Then by all means, speak up. I've been trying that for centuries, too. I would like, if you would indulge me, to call on one of my colleagues to stand in, or in this case, to sit in for Mr. Plessy. The time, 1892. The place, Covington, Louisiana. The case, Plessy versus Ferguson. And now, sir, if you would be so kind as to tell the court your name and background. Plessy, sir, Homer Adolph Plessy, age 34. I'm seven-eighths Caucasian and one-eighth African blood, or as they say, an octoroon. And what happened to you, sir? I was riding on a train going from New Orleans across the state to Covington with a first-class ticket. I was in a coach that was reserved for whites. My plan, you see, was to test the segregation law. I was told by the conductor to leave the car. I refused. Shortly thereafter, I was arrested. And what did the Louisiana court say when your case came up? They said that the law which required the railroad to supply equal but separate accommodations for the white and colored races was legal. And what did you do then? I appealed to the United States Supreme Court. On what grounds? On the grounds that I was being deprived of my right to equal protection under the law. And you won. And I lost. Justice Brown, delivering the majority opinion, said laws permitting and even requiring their separation do not necessarily imply the inferiority of either race. In other words, Mr. Plessy, your appeal to the Supreme Court was turned down? In other words, yes. Ah, but let us not forget there was one lone dissenter in that case, and ironically, his are the words that have taken on the most meaning. That would be Justice Harlan. And if I may be permitted to quote him, he said, in view of the Constitution, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows or tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. That didn't help our Mr. Plessy, did it? No, perhaps not. But it did signify that even on the high bench, a minority opinion can sometimes be stronger in the long run than a majority opinion. In other words... No other words, sir. Those will do just fine. I thank you for that. You're welcome. 
We move on to the year now, 1954. The case, Brown versus the Board of Education. Oh, well, yes. uh, may I have the brief for that, please? How come? It's not a woman's rights issue. Mm, no, no it isn't, but it is a human rights issue. The issue in Brown versus the Board of Education had to do with the effect of segregation on the public education. It was Chief Justice Earl Warren who delivered the opinion for a unanimous Supreme Court and he stated, quote, in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. As a result, local authorities in 1955 were ordered to end segregation in the schools with all deliberate speed. It took a long time to go from Dred Scott to Plessy to Brown. Perhaps uh, we gave more emphasis to deliberate than, to, than we did to speed. In truth, the wheels of justice sometimes grind exceedingly slow. Yes, sir. But they do grind, and they do change with the times. Why, just the fact that we are standing up here today showing our awards as well as our medals is testimony to the elasticity of the Constitution. Elasticity? Now, that's, that's an interesting choice of words. Do you mean by that the right to stretch the truth? No, sir, I do not. It is the right to interpret the truth in the light of evidence and precedent and in our search for the truth, sir, we will deny no man to speak out on any subject, nor do we hold the publication of any material that we deem to be in the public interest. Ah, the New York Times versus the United States. Sir, is that a fact or is that a case? <laughs> It is a case, as you well know. The year 1971, the issue, the publication of the famous Pentagon Papers. Speaking for the New York Times, it is my contention that we have the right to publish classified materials no matter where or how they were obtained. It is the government's opinion that you must be enjoined from doing so on grounds of national security. But in order to enjoin us, you must meet the burden of proof necessary to impose prior restraints on expression. In, in other words... No, 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 no other words. You, you can't stop somebody from printing something. I mean, even if you think, but before they print it, even if you think they do print it, it might embarrass someone, or it might affect security after the fact. Seems to me the rights of a free press take precedence here over the rights of the executive branch to, to suppress information. You know, it seems as if the Supreme Court would agree with you. They voted six to three that the government didn't prove its case for prior restraints, and the First Amendment was upheld. There you go with that First Amendment stuff again. You make it sound like freedom of speech is an absolute. Not an absolute. If I may quote Justice Holmes, the most stringent protection of speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. Now that decision was handed down right here in the shadow of Independence Hall where free speech was born. There are obviously two sides to every issue. Otherwise there would be no disagreement and no need for a final arbiter like the Supreme Court. <laughs> well, if you'll forgive me, sir, two sides is already a blessing. I mean, especially these days. Why, it seems to me in the past half century that the issues have become more polarized and the opinions more diverse. And discourse more heated. Just look at the cases that have come before the court. Gideon versus Wainwright, Abington versus Shemp, Roe versus Wade. Ooh, sounds like a fight card in Madison Square Garden. Well, in a way, each case was a heavyweight bout and the outcome touched all our lives. 1963. Abington versus Shemp. The issue, prayer in the schools. What's wrong with a little reading of the Bible? Those who don't believe are not forced to attend. But aside from the basic issue of separation of church and state, which is required by the very first provision of the First Amendment, it singles out those children who don't want to attend and may make them an object of derision. If I may, sir, Justice Clark, 
writing in the majority corner said, the place of religion in our society is an exalted one, achieved through a long tradition of reliance on the home, the church, and the inviolable citadel of the individual heart and mind. It is not within the power of the government to invade the citadel. Gideon versus Wainwright, 1963. In keeping with the boxing metaphor, Gideon in this battle claims he was handicapped in his fight for justice by not having proper counsel in his corner. Justice Black delivered a telling blow for fairness when he said, from the very beginning, our state and national constitutions and laws have laid great emphasis on procedural and substantive safeguards designed to assure fair trials before impartial tribunals in which every defendant stands equal before the law. This noble ideal cannot be realized if the poor man charged with a crime has to face his accuser without a lawyer to assist him. Roe versus Wade, 1973. The issue, abortion. I'll take it. <laughs> the issue is about personal privacy and a woman's right to, ter to terminate her pregnancy. It's not just a personal issue. It's a constitutional one as well. Yes. This one has jurisdictional, ethical, religious, moral, medical, and philosophical implications. When is a fetus a human being with rights? And who determines this? Now, what about the mother? What about her rights? <laughs> you talk about your heavyweight contest. The issue of whether a state has the right to ban abortion except for the purpose of saving the life of the mother was decided by the Supreme Court in favor of the mother and against the state. However, the fight on this one will continue long after the principles have left the ring. This small sampling of cases represents pages and pages, volumes and volumes, and year upon year of court decisions that stir the hearts and challenge the minds of the decision makers. Some are popular, some are scorned, some lasting, and some temporary, but all are made with the of intentions to live up to the spirit of the Constitution. In truth, then, the Constitution is a living document. It is both a weapon and a shield. And the chosen few who sit in the bench of the highest court in the land are charged with an awesome lifetime responsibility. The panorama of judicial decisions over the past two centuries, whether you approve or disapprove of them, gives testimony to the soundness of the original document and the integrity of its interpreters. For the poor citizen with no recourse to legal aid, for the black family who want their children to achieve, for the unwed mother, the teacher in the classroom, the agnostic, the student protester, the reporter, the leader, as well as the average citizen who labors mightily to maintain his family and his values and his standard of living. For all those who pursue happiness, love liberty, and embrace life, we gratefully acknowledge the noble concept that guides our democracy. In other words, long live the Constitution and the Supreme Court. Well said. benefits greatly from the freedoms guaranteed by the Constitution. Possibly the most visibly appreciative group is a creative community. Painters, writers, musicians, dancers, actors, directors, choreographers, all accept as their due the license to create without censorship or fear of reprisal. Thirty years ago, this very month, in 1957, a musical opened on Broadway. It set new standards of excellence in just about every category. It was Romeo and Juliet, transplanted to the mean streets of New York City. The show, book by Arthur Lawrence, music by Leonard Bernstein, lyrics by Stephen Sondheim, 
was directed and choreographed by Jerome Robbins. It was called West Side Story. Tonight, we are pleased to have with us the current company from the 30th anniversary production to recreate one of the most dynamic and exciting numbers in the show. It not only showcases all the creative forces at the peak of their powers, but also makes an important sociological statement in a most entertaining fashion. The statement is that in a democracy, we can joke with impunity about conditions that exist. And sometimes, by shining the spotlight on them, we can do something about making those conditions better. Here now is Valerie Pettiford and the cast of West Side Story to illustrate the point. Maria! She has a mother, also a father? They do not know this country any better than she does. You do not know it at all. Jealousy of Rito Avan, she's in America now. But Puerto Rico is in America now. Ay. Ay, Anita, Josefina. Explain, Anita, now. Teresita del Carmen Margarita. Immigrant. <laughs> Thank God you can't change your hair. Huh? <laughs> is that possible? Oh. In the U.S. Everything is real. Mira, Chino, mira, guys. How was she when you took her home? All right, Nardo. She was only dancing. Aye, with an American who is really a Polak. <laughs> Says the speak. Ooh. You are not so cute. That Tony is. And he works. A delivery boy. And what are you? An assistant. See. And Chino makes half of what the Polak makes. The Polak is American. Aye, right, here comes the whole commercial. <laughs> the mother of Tony was born in Poland. The, the father still goes to night school. school. But, but Tony, Tony was born in America, so that makes him American. But us foreigners. Yes. 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 You remember how we were when we first came here? Did we even think of going back? No. We came ready, eager, with a heart open, with arms open. You came with your pants open. <laughs> Pig, you'll go back in handcuffs. Well, I'm going back with a tidy lock. Oh. Air conditioned, built-in bar, telephone, television, compatible color, and a king-size bed. I mumble. Come on. Come on. Well, are you or aren't you? Well, are you or aren't you? Well, are you? You have your big, important war council? The council? Or me? Uh, uh. First one, and then the other. <laughs> I'm an American girl now, I don't wait. <laughs> well, back home in another place. Back home, little boys don't have work councils. Well, you want me to be an American? Ay, Dios. Vámonos, chicos. Es tarde. Buenas noches, Anita. Josefina. Teresita. Del Carmen. Margarita. Etc. 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 Ooh, that's a very pretty name. Etc. She means well. We have many pretty names at home. At home. At home. It is so nice at home. Why don't you go back there? I would like to. Just for a successful visit.
tribute not only to a document, but to the people of America who make it live. Nowhere is it more important that this great document be understood than in the hearts and minds of our young people. It was to this end that a writing competition was set up under auspices of the American Bar Association and the Gannett USA Today Company. It was called the National Bicentennial Writing Competition and it was open to high school students in all states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. 52 state winners were selected and brought to Williamsburg, Virginia to participate in a reenactment of the original constitutional debates. They then went on to the White House where the president welcomed them and announced the grand prize winner. As it turned out, the judges could not select a single winner. So they awarded duplicate first prizes of $10,000 each to Liza Johnson, 16, from Portsmouth, Ohio, and Mahboob Majumdar, also 16, from the state of Washington. Right here in Philadelphia, another essay contest was taking place. It was tied into the celebration of Black History Month, 
program is sponsored by the Philadelphia Board of Education. The winners of that contest also are in the hall this evening. Their names are Monique Armstrong, age 10, representing the elementary school division, Shannon Newby, age 14, representing the junior high school division, and Napoleon Williams, age 17, representing the high school division. I'd like all these students now to stand so that we can acknowledge their accomplishment with our applause. Turn in a moment with the introduction of a new song written especially for this occasion and performed by its composer, one of America's most talented and popular artists. Gentlemen, Barry Manilow. Treaties of the sweet land of liberty of thee I sing land where my fathers died land of the pilgrim's pride
come now to the end of our bicentennial celebration. And soon we'll all go back to our everyday lives. As Abraham Lincoln noted on another historical occasion, the world will little note nor long remember what transpired here. But that's not the important thing. Perhaps what is most noteworthy is the fact that we are able to accept freedom and liberty and human rights as normal and natural conditions of life in America. As a result of what happened 200 years ago today, we live with hope and pride and dignity. And it all stems from a faded piece of parchment and an unshakable belief in the power of the people. And that's the way it is. Thank you and good night. Assisting with travel to Philadelphia from throughout the United States is proud to have been part of this evening's celebration. Eastern, we've got your ticket to America's history. We, the people of Hyatt Hotels and Resorts, are proud to have been selected to provide accommodations for tonight's tribute. Hyatt salutes the 200th anniversary of the Constitution. the Constitution, the Library of Congress suggests these books, Decision in Philadelphia by Christopher and James L. Collier, The Genius of the People by Charles L. Mee, and Witnesses at the Creation by Richard B. Morris. These and many other informative books are waiting for you in your local library and bookstore. Visit them. They'll be happy to help you read more about it. This is CBS. Hello, I'm Alan Frio. And I'm